good evening. Uh, I would like to thank you very much for, for being here uh, tonight on behalf of the Nabil family, uh, dean of the School of Global Affairs and, and Public Policy. Uh, dean family would have very much liked to, to be here today and he was prepared to be here. However, a horrible cold has kept him from, uh, from being with us. So on his behalf, I'd like to thank you for being here and on his behalf, and uh, also uh, me personally, I'd like to uh, express my great pleasure uh, in welcoming uh, Judge Abdelkawi Youssef in Cairo at AUC and at the Tahrir Dialogues. I would like to especially thank him for having, despite his many commitments and full agenda, for having graciously extended his stay in Cairo for one day in order to address the Cairo community interested in international law and in international relations and the international system more generally. This morning in the new campus, he generously talked and engaged in discussions at the round table on international justice and globalization with faculty from several AUC departments. Abdul Qawi Yusuf is judge of the International Court of Justice and is vice president of the court since February 2015. He is a member of the Institute of International, a member of the panel of arbitrator of the International Center for the Settlement of Investment Disputes and a member of the governing board of the International Council of Commercial Arbitrators. He holds a PhD in international law from the Graduate Institute of International Studies in Geneva, Switzerland. For this evening, after consultations, Judge Yusuf chose to talk to the Cairo community and to engage with it in a Tahrir dialogue about the impact of third world solidarity on the development of international law. He is well positioned to reflect and to deliver to you the fruits of his reflections on the subject. His professional career and the subjects of his research and publications are testimonies to that. Judge Yusuf has been at the heart of the international multilateral system. He held senior positions at UNESCO, UNIDO, UNCTAD, and quite importantly at the United Nations Transition Assistance Group, which helped with the transition to independence of Namibia. He was expert advisor on negotiations on the Convention on Biological Diversity, the GATT Uruguay-wide negotiations on the trade-related aspects of intellectual property rights, UNESCO conventions on protecting cultural heritage and cultural expressions, and he participated as a delegate at conferences that negotiated the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea. The subjects of his publications are eloquent. They include without being exclusive to trade and intellectual property, the new international economic order, right to development, sustainable development, biodiversity, technology transfer, cultural rights and cultural heritage, the law of the sea, humanitarian law, government failure, and fragile state institutions. All these subjects are of direct and a special interest to the third world, the famous three continents of decades past. Judge Joseph naturally has a particular interest in Africa, hence the institutions he founded and chaired all contributed to founding. The African Year Book of International Law, the African Institute of International Law, the African Association of International Law, the African Foundation of International Law, institutions that serve the continent by familiarizing it with international law, 
but also help develop international law by opening channels for the contributions of Africa and Africans to the discipline. Abdelkhal Yusuf comes from Somalia, a historically dear country from Egypt and the Egyptians. Somalia and Egypt are both African, situated in the east of the continent, and Arab. That he comes from Somalia is evidence that even failed states continue contributing to the international system through its bright and successful individuals. These individuals keep showing the bright aspects of their communities despite their extended human tragedies. Judge Joseph will speak for some 50 minutes, after which I may have a couple of questions to pose to him. A discussion with the audience will follow. You are kindly invited to write your questions on cards that will be circulated in the floor. I will collect them and attempt to organize the discussion by reading them, avoiding repetition, and merging some of the issues that will be raised. On a personal level, I am particularly moved in introducing uh, Judge Abdullah Yusuf uh, given the strong bonds that have united us for decades and decades. But I would not like to finish my short introduction without saying how great this evening is for international law in Cairo. We have the immense privilege of the presence in the audience of the summit and master of international law, our dear friend and master, Professor George Abisab, who graced this Oriental Hall in February of this year with a memorable closing address to the Conference of the Third World Approaches to International Law, also Third World, as you notice. George, you're most welcome in the Oriental Hall. So after this short introduction, I would like you to please join me in welcoming George Abdullah Yusuf to the podium. I thank uh, my friend Ibrahim Awad uh, for his very kind words. And I must say that I am doubly honored to be here tonight because it is a first for me to speak in such a beautiful hall. I am really overwhelmed by the beauty of the hall and by the oriental decoration above us. And I'm also honored because it must be a first for a Somali to speak here in this dialogue. So it's a double honor for me. And I would like to say a few words about uh, the title of the lecture, because we said we would talk about the third world and the impact of the third world, third world solidarity on the development of international law. But you don't hear very much these days about the third world. And that's one of the reasons why we thought uh, we should refer to it. Uh, but it might be useful to go back to the etymology of the expression. As you may know, the origin of this expression lies in the French phrase, terre monde. And it was first coined by Alfred Sauvy as a play on the French revolutionary Tiers Etat, the Third Estate. Well, 
I'm quite sure that you may disagree with that, although this is what the dominant literature in international relations on the third world says, because I would not be surprised if you said no, the phrase the third world was coined in Egypt. Uh, and I'm quite sure that others may say it was coined elsewhere. But uh, this is uh, what is usually uh, uh, referred to as uh, the tiers d'état or the tiers monde in French literature because Sovi was making an analogy between the fight pitting the clergy against the nobility in pre-revolutionary France on the one hand, and the Cold War confrontation between the West and the communist world in the 1950s. So according to him, what was of interest to each of these two worlds, the communist world on the one hand and the Western world on the other, was to conquer the third world, or at least to have it on its side. The challenge was therefore for each of these two blocks to deal with this third world which was exploited and despised it, just like the Terceta, but also courted and wanted by the two other blocks, the two other worlds, and for this purpose to understand what was it really, what was it that this third world, this Terceta, exactly wanted? Because the other two blocks were caught in it and were trying to have it on their side, on each one's side. It's my view that the answer to this question is that during this period, and I'm talking about the 1950s, because that is when Sovi wrote his article, that in the immediate aftermath of the Second World War, this third world wanted to recover, to regain its human dignity, and to enjoy freedom and human rights of which it had been deprived for a long time through colonial domination. And I think that we devote and we dedicate, since we are in the Square of Liberation, in Tahrir Square, we therefore dedicate this lecture on the impact of the world to the liberation of the third world. So that is the first reason why I use the concept of third world, which is no longer in use in international relations here, to be able to talk about international law and people's rights to freedom and dignity. The people of what was referred to as the third world at the time were those who needed most to regain their freedom and dignity. The second reason is due to the use of the word impact in the title of the lecture. In order to assess the impact of a political or a societal initiative on the evolution of law, whether it is domestic law or international law, you have to look back and see whether during a certain period of time this initiative had the necessary impact on the 
reform, modification, and progressive development of the law. And so we have to go back, and I will take you back a little bit to the 1940s. I will start from the 1940s because as far as I know, it was at the Manchester Congress of the Pan-African movement that the first explicit expression of Asian-African solidarity was expressed or was actually made. The African delegates at the Manchester Conference and they included some of the future leaders of African states like Kwame Nkrumah, Jomo Kenyatta, and uh, the former president also of Malawi, President uh, Banda. They say that they expressed their solidarity with the peoples of Asia and this was the first group which with they expressed their solidarity in the hope that before long the peoples of Asia and Africa would have broken their centuries old chains of colonialism and then as free nations stand united to consolidate and safeguard their liberties and independence from the restoration of Western imperialism as well as the danger of communism. This was perhaps the first explicit expression of what later came to be known as the non-aligned movement. We are neither with the West nor with the East. We are newly independent states and we would like to take our own path to uh, contribute uh, to the well-being of the international community. I will give you a second example which also comes from that period but which is contemporaneous with the coinage of the phrase, the third world. And that second example comes from Cairo, where the Council of the Arab League held its meeting in 1953. And the Council passed a resolution when the Sultan of Morocco was deposed on 20 August 1953 by the French. And in that resolution, the Arab League not only expressed its concern for the national aspirations of the Moroccan people, but also declared, and I quote, that the Council considers that as a preliminary step, the Arab delegations to the United Nations, supported, supported by the delegates of the Asian African nations, should continue their efforts to submit the Tunisian and Moroccan questions to the General Assembly. They call it upon the, African, the Arab delegations at the United Nations in cooperation with all the Asian and African delegations at the United Nations to continue their efforts for the realization of the aspirations for independence of the peoples of Tunisia and Morocco. And this was one of the first resolutions on Asian-African solidarity that was sent to the delegations of African and Asian countries at the United Nations to encourage them to use this universal forum 
to reform the system of international law. And the reason why I'm saying to reform the system of international law is because the French government presented the deposition of the Sultan or the King of Morocco at the time as an act of sedition. They said it was an internal rebellion against the French authorities and therefore he was deposed because of that. But that was not the view of the Asian and African delegations, nor was it the view of the Council of the Arab League, who felt that these people were fighting for their right to self-determination, and they were not part of France. And therefore, this was not an act of sedition against the French authorities, it was part of the fight for freedom and dignity by the Moroccan people. And therefore, they placed the fight of the Tunisian and Moroccan peoples in the context of public international law, and particularly of the principle of equal rights and self-determination of peoples, which was inscribed for the first time in the Charter of the United Nations in 1945. These two examples of Asian-African solidarity, an expression of Asian-African solidarity for joint action at the international level, not only to affect the system and have an impact of the system, but to reform international law in the system of international relations was followed by the largest expression of solidarity, and I come to the word solidarity, third world solidarity, the largest expression of solidarity between the Asian and African nations, which was realized through the convening of the first Asian-African conference in Bandung, Indonesia, in 1954. And this was a milestone in international relations and in the emergence of the new and newly independent states at the international level. Because for the first time, they were able to articulate in a very clear manner their conception of international relations and their understanding of the principles of international law. And of course, at the foundation of their concerns was the decolonization of the peoples of Africa and Asia, most of which were at the time under colonial domination. So what did they say? And I think I will give you this declaration of Bandung, and then we will examine the rules which emerged at the international level and the extent to which they were influenced by the Bandung Declaration. But let me first of all spell out what was said in Bandung, especially on colonialism. The African and Asian countries that which met in the Bandung Conference declared that colonialism in all its manifestations is an evil which should speedily be brought to an end. And they affirmed that the subjection of people is to alien subjugation, domination and exploitation constitutes a denial of fundamental human rights is contrary to the Charter of the United Nations 
and is an impediment to the promotion of world peace and cooperation. And it calls on all the powers concerned, that is the Bandung Conference, calls on all the powers concerned, that's the colonial powers, to grant freedom and independence to all dependent peoples. And for the first time in the history of international relations, because the UN Charter speaks of a principle of equal rights and self-determination of peoples, but it does not refer to a right of self-determination of peoples. And the Bandung Declaration, for the first time, referred to a right of peoples to self-determination. And it went further, and it said that this right of self-determination is a prerequisite. It is a prerequisite of the full enjoyment of all fundamental human rights. So without the right to self-determination of peoples, you cannot enjoy all the fundamental human rights. I will now move to three examples, because that's all the time we have, of rules and principles that have been introduced at the international level thanks to the solidarity of the Asian and African nations, accompanied very often by the older states of Latin America with respect to certain principles of international law. And that's why I'm talking about the impact of third world solidarity on the progressive development of international law. Because although the Asian and African states spearheaded most of these initiatives, they were often accompanied by the not so newly independent states of Latin America, which had also suffered as a result of the application, particularly in the economic field of the public law of Europe during the 19th century and the early part of the 20th century. The first rule to which I will refer is a rule that was laid down and established by Resolution 1514, thanks to the initiative of the Asian African Group. This is a historical resolution, as you all know, and it is the resolution which lays down the right of colonial peoples to independence. And before the Asian African states took up the initiative for that resolution, it was Prime Minister Khrushchev of the Soviet Union who suggested that there should be a resolution on the right to independence of peoples. But the draft proposal that was submitted by the Soviet Union was not accepted, and it was the proposal that was submitted by Cambodia and 42 African and Asian UN member states, it was a draft resolution sponsored by Cambodia and 42 African and UN member states, which was adopted by the UN General Assembly on 14 December 1960. Resolution 1514 is based to a large extent on the principles enunciated in the section on dependent peoples of the Bandung Declaration, and it was adopted without a single dissenting vote by the UN General Assembly. It was the culmination of a concerted effort by the African Asian countries to reform 
international law, in particular those norms and principles which supported and legitimized the colonial enterprise in Africa, Asia, and the Caribbean. Although the resolution was recommendatory in nature, as all UNGA resolutions, United Nations General Assembly resolutions, and did not by itself have the force of law, its provisions gradually acquired the status of customary international law due to the weight they were accorded by the principal organs of the United Nations. To give you an example, the International Court of Justice, in its advisory opinion in Namibia, in, on Namibia in 1971, observed that the court must take into consideration the changes which have occurred in the supervening half a century. And its interpretation cannot remain unaffected by the subsequent development of law through the charter of the UN and by way of customary law. And then the court referred to resolution 1514 as a further important stage in this development, which applies to all peoples and territories which have not yet attained their independence. So from a normative perspective, resolution 1514 must be read as an interpretation of the principles already enunciated in the Charter particularly with respect to its explicit articulation of the symbiotic relationship between equal rights of peoples and self-determination of peoples in the Charter. The African Asian states, together with the Latin American states, showed great solidarity and cooperation in the elaboration of other UN standard setting and interpretative declarations. And I would like to give you the second example from the 1970 UN declaration on principles of international law concerning friendly relations and cooperation between states in accordance with the UN Charter and the role that the Third World played in the elaboration of those principles was the subject of a seminar article by Professor George Abisab here, who published it in the Review Egyptienne du Droit International, and the manner in which the Third World countries actually contributed to the elaboration of these principles which, in my view, constitute the most important reform of international law in the post-charter era. And one of the most important contributions of this declaration lay in the emphasis that colonial situations and conflicts were not to be considered as falling within the ambit of domestic affairs of states, and the declaration clearly established that the territory of a colony or other non-self-governing territory has under the charter a status separate and distinct from the territory of the state administering it. And such separate and distinct status under the charter shall exist until the people of the colony or non-self-governing territory have exercised their right of self-determination. And you know, I, I'm quite sure you are familiar with the reason why this emphasis was laid in, the, in these principles at the behest of the Asian African countries.
because at the time, Portugal was arguing before the Security Council of the United Nations that Mozambique, Angola, uh, Cap Verde were part of Portuguese territory and that therefore the United Nations, contrary to its own principles and to the principles of the Charter, was interfering in the domestic affairs of Portugal. And this is why the, one of the most important principles that had to be laid down in the 1970 declaration was that the territory of the colony or of the non-self-governing territory was separate and distinct from the territory of the colonial power. But let me go to the second rule which emerged in the context of this set of principles, also at the initiative of the third world countries, because it is related also to the fight for freedom and dignity and to the realization of independence by the third world countries. And it has to do with the repression by the colonial powers of the liberation movement is, that is sprang up in many countries, in many colonized countries, and the support that African countries, through the liberation committee of the Organization of African Unity, were extending to those liberation movements. And of course, colonial countries like Portugal, uh, racial minority regimes like those in Rhodesia and South Africa at the time argued that this was an interference in their internal affairs by other African states and that this was also contrary to the prohibition of the use of force by states members of the United Nations. And so the Asian African countries had to bring before this committee on principles of international law, on friendly relations uh, uh, under the charter of the, between states under, in accordance with the charter of the United Nations, the fact that assistance to liberation movements to resist oppression and colonization was not contrary to the Charter. And the African countries sought this clarification and the non-aligned movement supported the African countries. So a proposal was submitted to the committee by Ghana representing Africa, India representing Asia, and Yugoslavia representing the non-aligned movement in general. And this proposal provided that the prohibition on the use of force shall not affect the right of peoples to self-defense against colonial domination in the exercise of their right to self-determination. Of course, at the beginning, as was to be expected, this proposal caused a lot of controversy in the Special Committee of the United Nations. But it was finally adopted under the principle of equal rights and self-determination of peoples with the following wording, and I will quote, every state has the duty to refrain from any forcible action which deprives people referred to above. These are the people who are entitled to the right to self-determination and to independence. In the elaboration of the present principle of their right to self-determination and freedom and independence, in their actions against and resistance to such forcible action, 
and in pursuit of the exercise of their right to self-determination, such people are entitled to seek and to receive. They are entitled to seek and to receive support in accordance with the purposes and principles of the Charter. So, this affirmation of the right of people is fighting for their independence to receive support from friendly countries in their resistance to colonial oppression constituted a triumph for the newly independent African and Asian states because so many of their views and positions regarding the constitutive principles of international law were now for the first time being incorporated and reflected in provisions of the declaration. Thirdly, and this is the third example that I will take, and I will take it from uh, uh, a different uh, resolution, and this was a resolution adopted by the UN General Assembly on permanent sovereignty over natural resources. This was equally a milestone in the revision and reform of customary norms which existed before the Charter of the United Nations and were borrowed from the public law of Europe in the 19th century. It is an expression of socio-economic self-determination and it involves the right of peoples to pursue their economic, social and cultural development which is of course referred to as the right to development and the right of peoples to freely dispose of their natural wealth and resources. Both of these rights find also their origin in the Bandung Declaration of 1955 and as well as in the efforts that were deployed by the Latin American states in the 1950s in the context of the UN to have at least some aspects of the Calvo Doctrine recognized under general international law and in the resolutions of the United Nations. So when the principle of permanent sovereignty over natural resources was proclaimed in the, by the UN in 1962, it was thought that control over the natural resources would enable the newly independent countries to achieve economic independence from former colonial powers and their enterprises. As you may remember, it was the period in which luminaries like Nkrumah kept talking about neocolonialism. We got rid of colonialism, but neocolonialism was now oppressing our peoples. It was also envisioned that such states would use their resources for the economic empowerment of their peoples and in the pursuit of their social economic and cultural development. What has happened? Unfortunately, the benefits derived from these resources were either diverted by the political leadership in many developing countries for their own personal ends or otherwise misused by the autocratic ruling elites, resulting in what has been referred to as the resource curse, particularly in African countries, where it has been observed that an inverted relationship often exists between resource empowerment and economic 
development. It should, however, be recalled that UN Resolution 1803 on the permanent sovereignty over natural resources of 1962 sponsored by the third world countries and which constituted, of course, an expression of their solidarity, made it clear that the permanent sovereignty over natural resources belonged to the people and not to the state, nor to its governmental authorities. This was later confirmed by Common Article 1 of the two UN Covenants on Human Rights, which provided in paragraph 2 that, and I quote, all people may, for their own ends, freely dispose of their natural wealth and resources without prejudice to any obligations arising out of international cooperation based upon the principle of mutual benefit and international law. It is also stipulated in Article 21 of the African Charter on Human and People's Rights that all people shall freely dispose of their wealth and natural resources. This right shall be exercised in the exclusive interest of the people, and in no case, in no case, shall a people be deprived of it. This is a reaffirmation of the fiduciary relationship which exists between the state and its citizens in the management and utilization of natural resources. This fiduciary relationship implies certain rights and duties in the sense that the people's rights impose corresponding duties to the state and its institutions. What are these duties? First of all, the government has to manage such resources for the benefit of the people, because it is a fiduciary relationship, and ensure that they are not diverted for the use of a section of the population or of individuals exercising political power. Secondly, State institutions have an obligation not to use such resources in a way that may cause substantial harm to the health and environment of the people. Thirdly, it is the duty of the state to protect intergenerational rights, particularly with respect to non-renewable resources. To come now to the conclusion of our lecture, I would like to say that the solidarity of third world states and its contribution to the reform and progressive development of international law is not, as you can imagine, limited to the few illustrative examples which I have referred to. It encompasses a much larger area and a space of normative reforms and it is a reflection of the part and of the role that the newly independent Asian African states and not so newly independent Latin American states played in the reform of all the rules and the influence that they have exercised on the emergence of new rules in the context of the universal international law, which may be said to have emerged as a result of the adoption of the Charter of the UN following the end of the Second World War. 
to realize their reform objectives. These third world states championed two types of universal lawmaking procedures and they used two methods to bring to fruition their reform efforts. The first method was the elaboration of general resolutions or normative declarations through the United Nations General Assembly. And the examples which I have just mentioned actually are uh, uh, attest to that. The second method was the promotion of codification conventions in important areas of international law. And I would like to say a few words about this codification because there is always a misunderstanding about the codification conferences and the codification exercise at the international legal, on the, at the international uh, uh, level. The codification advocated by the developing countries was not aimed at simply writing down or reinstating the existing law, which is so far as international custom was concerned, remained uncertain and imprecise and sometimes even undesirable in the eyes of the third world. Instead, this state is called for the codification in the sense of development and revision. And this was what was originally contemplated in article, draft article 13 of the United Nations Charter, which finally became progressive development of international law and its codification in the final version of the Charter. So in this context, codification constituted for the third world countries the development of the law in the sense of filling in gaps and above all making changes to it in light of new developments on the world stage and in particular in light of the sociological changes or changes in the sociological structure of the international community in the sense that new states, new peoples came to the world stage and these peoples were not actors in the past at the world stage but now they could play a role in the elaboration and formulation of international rules. This state is also wanted, the, wanted this progressive development of international law to draw from the main forms of civilization and the principal legal systems of the world as contemplated in Article 9 of the Statute of the International Court of Justice. So through the collaboration of African Asian countries at the United Nations and in codification conferences, both inside and outside the United Nations framework, this third world solidarity has substantially contributed to the universalization of international law and to the universal reach of its norms, thus enabling us today here in Cairo to speak of a body of norms, international law, that has been shaped particularly in the last 60 years by a diverse but also competing and complementary legal traditions and approaches to international governance and international rulemaking. It is thanks to the outcome of this third world solidarity in international fora that we can refer today 
to international law as having been effectively enriched by diverse traditions and outlooks. And I thank you very much. Thank you very much for, for this uh, review of historical review and legal analysis of how the third world has contributed. In fact, probably the contributions of the third world also helped join the third world. Uh, the, the, the contributions helped reinforce uh, the, the new states by expressing themselves, by expressing themselves in the international uh, scene, they were also reinforcing their existence as sovereign, sovereign entities. And they could do that no one puts into question the legitimacy of the states that came into being in the late 1950s, very late 1950s, and in the early 1960s, or starting in the early 1960s. Now, as, as I said, I have two questions, and this is my first question based on what I've just said. And how about now? What is the contribution of the successors to the third world? Because you said that third world does not exist, and you know, you know this now, this expression of the global south uh, has taken over from the third world. How is it that the successors to the third world contribute to the development of international law and the globalization? Because these are different conditions, and the international system has has changed itself. So, how and what are the issues that uh, these successes to the third world um, are are most interested in? This is my first question, and my second question is with relation with what you said about natural resources. But in fact, it's not about natural resources. But a very interesting principle established is that, what you said, the right belongs to peoples. Right to belong to people. Does this make peoples a subject of international law? This is my question. But second, why is it that in the last four decades, in so-called successive peace processes. Rather than referring to the Palestinian people, the reference is to Palestinians. Is this, is this, is there, is there a link there? Uh, is, it, is it a way to avoid a recognition of the Palestinian people as a subject, if, of course, uh, the, the my, my inference uh, that, that uh, uh, there is a principle of a right to people, and if there is a, a, a right to people, then I can infer that there is a subject. And so why is it not in the United Nations uh, documents, but in parallel peace processes, peace processes, there is always a reference to Palestinian people as Palestinians and not as, as, as Palestinians. These are my two questions, and then, of course, if you wish to, to react now, uh, please go ahead, otherwise we'll, we'll see the, uh, uh, the, the questions. Well, I think that we all know that the type of solidarity which I described earlier uh, among third world countries uh, does not exist today. Uh, it was a solidarity organized around common objectives and common purposes. And 
as soon as those common objectives and common purposes disappeared because some of the objectives and purposes were realizing like decolonization, like sovereignty over natural resources, uh, then that solidarity uh, disappeared to a large extent. But there are certain institutional uh, mechanisms which were created as part of that solidarity that exist up to this moment, up to this period, and which still exercise some sort of influence at the international level with regard to international law. I'm referring here to an institution that was created already in 1958 by the Asian African countries following the Bandung Conference, the Asian African Legal Consultative Committee which later became and is known today as the Asian African Legal Consultative Organization. And it was under the auspices of this organization that the concept, for example, of exclusive economic zone in the context of the law of the sea was developed and proposed by the African countries why the Latin American countries were proposing and putting forward the concept of patrimonial sea. And finally, what was adopted in the Law of the Sea Convention was the notion of exclusive economic zone, which is considered today as customary norm of international law. So the contribution of the Asian African countries continued to a certain extent, but of course it does not have today the same impact and the same influence that it had in the 1960s and 1970s, early 70s. Because there was a period in which the Asian African countries try to propose and implement a new international economic order at the international level. And you remember the declaration on the uh, new international economic order that was uh, adopted by the United Nations in 1974, but uh, of course, on, uh, not by consensus, but on the basis of majority voting. And their initiatives to a certain extent in the economic sector, in the economic and social sector, ran out of steam when this attempt at creating a new international economic order and at reforming the international relations in the economic field failed. And then the developed countries started dealing with the third world countries on a bilateral basis instead of having to confront them as a bloc at the international level. Some sort of divide and rule. And of course what succeeded finally were the principles and rules that were laid down through bilateral agreements, like the bilateral investment treaties that were concluded by the developing countries with the developed countries. So I think that to a certain extent, the strength and power of the solidarity which I described during the 1950s and 60s has not unfortunately continued to exist up to this time at the international level. Now with respect to permanent sovereignty over natural resources, of course the right belongs to peoples and I think that it has to be exercised as I say on behalf 
of the people uh, and on behalf of the bearers of the right. And does this mean that peoples are subjects of international law? Well, the International Court of Justice in the Western Sahara case said for the first time that peoples were the bearers of rights and so actually brought peoples to the international plane and you cannot talk of a right of peoples to self-determination and that's why it took some time for the court to state that the right of peoples to self-determination was not only a principle or the, the, the principle of self-determination was not only a principle as was enshrined in the charter but it was a right of peoples because in order to say that it was a right of peoples you have to recognize that peoples can be bearers of rights and obligations at the international level and therefore while the court did not affirm in the Namibia advisory opinion of 1971 of 1970 uh, that there was a right of peoples to self-determination and simply reaffirming the principle of equal rights and self-determination of peoples, it affirmed the existence of a right of peoples in the Western Sahara case and in the Rural case, so, and in the East Timor case. So, uh, of course, there is a right of peoples to self-determination. Now, Ibrahim raised a question which is more of a political nature than of a legal nature with respect to the Palestinians. Why in UN resolutions, instead of referring to the peoples of Palestine, no, 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 you have refer to people. It is, there is a outside processes led by the U.S. and other... Ah, okay. So, okay. it's always Palestinian, so is there... Uh, there will be a reason. Political. Political, I would say. It's a political reason. Uh, of course, it may have uh, certain underlying legal implications, but it is definitely for political reasons that those kind of wordings are used. But, as we know, uh, the people of Palestine are a people. And the court said very clearly in the World Advisory Opinion that the people of Palestine have a right to self-determination. So there is absolutely no doubt with respect to legal considerations that there is a people of Palestine that have a right to self-determination. Thank you very much for, for, for this answer and I'll follow it up with you later. Uh, we have, we have several, several questions here. Uh, I, will, I will read the questions to you and then you probably stop me if you, if you wish to, to, to reply to some of them and then, and then we'll take a second round. Uh, here are two questions about if um, the uh, third world and, and, and solidarity of the uh, so-called global south are not uh, what they used to be. So where do we look now for drivers of the very much needed reform of uh, the multilateral system and of uh, international law as uh, the question um, uh, puts it, um, and then the, the, the second uh, the second question here is again about the uh, implementation sources um, that existed in the solidarity of the third world sources for uh, changing uh, norms, and now where can we find the sources for? changing the multilateral system and 
for ensuring that its decisions are, are implemented. This is, this is the first, first question. Um, then there is a question about how to evaluate the status of third world solidarity in the face of terrorism. Uh, how, second question, you talked about state, citizens, natural resources, which brings into discussion the concept of the land. How do you see the idea of right holder and duty bearer in the context of the current refugee crisis in Europe? Uh, The same, the same, the same series of questions. How did the system of international law adapt, if it did, to the changes in global governance and increased influence of non-state actors? Then. Would you like to, to answer these questions? <laughs> yes, of course, of course. Well, let me start with the new drivers of international law reform. Uh, I think that personally the new drivers of international law reform would be the regional arrangements. Uh, I'm a believer in what's happening in Africa and the development of international law or public, what I call the public law of Europe, of, of Africa, sorry, the public law of Europe was the one of the 19th century. But the public law of Africa, which I'm quite sure will gradually seep into the fabric of international law and influence it, and I hope that it will influence it in the right direction. Because there are a number of normative developments at the African level which are, which create this optimism uh, for me. And if you take, for example, uh, the protocol, uh, the African protocol on the rights of women, I think it is an extremely progressive protocol which goes beyond the United Nations Convention against discrimination, uh, on discrimination against women. If you take the African Convention on Refugees, it goes beyond the United Nations Convention on Refugees of 1951. It's much more liberal, it's much more progressive, and it is capable of driving the reform of international law as far as refugees are concerned because it does not talk only about the persecution of the individual, it talks also about an individual running away from situations of conflict, from situations of uh, insecurity and civil war. So uh, I, I think it's much more progressive and it will drive. Uh, I take the African Convention, the Kambala Convention on Displaced Persons. And it is, well, you don't have a binding convention on displaced persons at the international level. So Africa has definitely innovated in that area and therefore it has no equal at the universal level. I take the African Charter on Human and People's Rights and I find that the right to development is the only binding instrument at the international level where the right to development is consecrated as a right is in that African instrument. At the universal level, it is in declarations and in all kinds of soft law instruments. So I think that this will be, the new drivers will be the regional arrangement. And I believe that uh, if the Latin American regional arrangement is, if eventually 
Asian regional arrangements, the League of Arab States and Arab countries, the African Union and the member states of the African Union, continue to innovate in the area of international law, they will no longer be followers. They will be leaders in the reform of international law. So that is my answer to the question on the new drivers of international law reform. And of course, for example, if you take the area of international investment uh, and the bilateral investment treaties, the most progressive model of uh, a BIT today is the model treaty of the SADC, which is the Southern Africa Development Cooperation uh, uh, Community. And uh, uh, it is really a trailblazer as far as the uh, progressive development of international investment law is concerned. Uh, solidarity in the context of terrorism, I could not understand that because uh, I don't think that there should be any solidarity in the context of terrorism. In combating. Uh, in, in combating, combating terrorism. Uh, I think that that solidarity will perhaps uh, emerge now because of what's happening in the world. Because uh, for a while, many of the third world countries uh, uh, in view of the confusion that existed uh, for some time between terrorism and national liberation movements, uh, tended to defend certain actions by liberation movements. And as I said, uh, the actions of liberation movements, especially to resist oppression, to resist colonialism, to, re to resist foreign domination, were in a way justified by the third world and the third world tried to bring them into the context of international law and to the type of actions that were permitted under international legal rules. But what's happening today is totally out of that context. It is just terrorism for the sake of terrorism. It's not a terrorism which is uh, a, uh, in pursuit, although I don't think that terrorism can be in pursuit of any uh, political objective, but it's not a terrorism in pursuit of a political objective or of a certain justifiable goal. So I think that there will be solidarity, not only among the third world, but also among all states to combat this kind of terrorism. But that solidarity will not only be within the context of legal rules, it will also be in the political field. Uh, the refugee crisis in Europe, uh, yes. Uh, what strikes me about the refugee crisis in Europe is the fact that when you turn on uh, the television or the radio in Europe, and I live in Europe, you never hear about a refugee crisis. You hear about migrants. You don't hear about refugees. And it is as though everybody was instructed in the media to talk about migrants rather than refugees. And I believe that uh, this is done for a clear purpose. Because refugees have a status in international law uh, they are recognized under international legal rules. Uh, they have certain rights and states have certain obligations towards refugees. But migrants are people who are just moving around for their own self-interest and to improve their lot. You move from one country to another because you think that you will improve your uh, living standard and well-being by going to another country. But you are not running away from uh, a threat to your life. You are not running away from persecution. You are not running away from war. You are not running away 
from massacres and mass murders. So uh, it is a different situation. And I think that the political leaders of Europe are starting to recognize now that many of these people are refugees and are waking up to the reality of the situation and I hope that that will continue. A international law and adaptation to globalization and increased influence of non-state actors. Of course, the law always has to adapt to new circumstances. And I was discussing this morning uh, with some of the faculty members of the Global Affairs Department of the American University of Cairo about the manner in which uh, globalization has always has impacted actually on the uh, norms and rules which govern international economic relations. And if you take, for example, international investment law. The BITs, or the Bilateral Investment Treaties, were created in a way to impose certain obligations on third world countries, on the countries of the South, and to delocalize uh, the dispute settlement mechanisms concerning the investment contracts and submit them to international arbitration. So the European countries for quite a long time have been the first and the primary advocates of bilateral investment treaties and always told the developing countries you have to conclude this kind of treaties with us in order to attract foreign investment and you have to submit yourself as a state to international arbitration when a foreign investor decides to bring a case against you before the international center for the settlement of international disputes. But more recently, what has happened is that the European countries themselves found out that more and more cases were being brought against them before exit arbitral tribunals. And all of a sudden, the European countries turned against the arbitral tribunals on international investments and in their negotiations with the United States on the transatlantic trade and investment partnership suggested and proposed that an international investment court modeled on the international court of justice should be created in order to deal with investor state disputes in the future. So things are changing to a certain extent because of globalization and because of the uh, new relations that are emerging also among the uh, newly uh, or the emerging economies in Asia, in certain parts of Europe, and the old economies uh, of Europe and the United States. So I think that this will definitely contribute in the future uh, to the uh, progressive development of new rules and mechanisms uh, for the settlement of investment disputes and to the relations between states and non-state actors, particularly uh, corporations. I think we stop it there as far okay. as the, So uh, if you have other questions. Yes, I have, I have one question here which I think you've already answered, but 
the consequences of neoliberalism, and I think you've already answered this. But the questions I have, in fact, do not relate directly to what you have said. However, they are quite interesting, and I know that that you uh, yourself are, are very interested in the subject. Uh, one of them, firstly, is about right to self-determination. How could exercising the right to self-determination in countries such as Libya, Syria, and Yemen, how could they be exercised? And how, what consequences the exercise of such right could have on the unity of the said countries? In other words, what are the, 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 the conditions for the exercise of the right to self-determination? The second, I think the second question is also of interest to you. I think it is about international law and dictatorships. How does international law deal with the question of undemocratically uh, designated uh, heads of states? Um, so I think that uh, you have written about that in the context of, of Africa. Uh, and then, and then uh, the, the, the last two questions that I have here um, are about your expectation for African unity in, in the future. And the further question is about what you expect uh, in respect of the reform of the United Nations Security Council. This, of course, is, is, uh, is a difficult uh, one and a complex one. Uh, I cannot really follow this question. Well, while, while you are reading that, maybe okay. I will well, try yes, to yes, yes. This is the idea. other question. Good idea. Uh, as far as the uh, exercise of the rights uh, of self-determination in countries like Yemen and Libya is concerned, I think we have to remember that international law is a system of law which primarily and principally applies among states. And it is the body of rules which is created by the states themselves to govern the relations between states. And so international law cannot, in a sense, shoot itself in the foot by undermining the sovereignty and territorial integrity of states. So the primary concern of international law is the stability of the state. It's not the fragmentation of the state. So the self-determination I was talking about was the self-determination with respect to external self-determination was decolonization. And the right to independence for peoples who are subject to colonial domination or alien subjugation, as the resolutions of the United Nations indicated. Now, there is another type, of course, of self-determination, but which does not necessarily lead to secession and to the fragmentation of the state. That is internal self-determination. And that is the type of self-determination that is addressed in common article one of the two United Nations covenants on political and several civil rights, and economic, social, and cultural rights, and on which states have to report to the United Nations Committee on Human Rights and to the United Nations Committee on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights. And that internal self-determination is actually the ability, the possibility for the people to participate in their self-government. And therefore, the need for uh, the people to be able, first of all, to be represented 
by the organs of the state in a clear and legitimate manner and secondly for certain sections of the population that may have a distinct racial or ethnic difference with the rest of the population uh, to be able to participate in the choice of their government. So that internal self-determination does not mean I belong to a province and all of a sudden I wake up one morning and I say I don't want to be part of this state and I walk up, I walk out on this state and I declare secession. That's not international law and that's not the fight to self-determination under international law. Uh, dictatorship. I think the uh, right to self-determination, internal right to self-determination also uh, addresses the issue of uh, dictatorship, the issue of uh, undemocratic changes on, or as the African Union calls it, the unconstitutional change of government. And you know that the African Union, as I said earlier, is actually rather more advanced in this area than other regional arrangements and than the binding instruments, the universal instruments at the international level. Because the African Union has a charter on democracy and good governance. And whenever there is, for example, an unconstitutional change of government in the African continent, like a coup d'etat, the country which has been subjected to such a coup d'etat is suspended by the African Union and is not allowed to participate in the activities of the African Union until such a country organizes free and fair elections. So, of course, this does not ensure that the people are legitimately and properly represented uh, at the governmental level uh, because uh, you know how elections are not really uh, the defining standard of democracy. The fact that you hold multi-party elections does not, it's not a decisive fact, factor uh, for the realization of democratic institutions, uh, but it is a positive step forward, I think, and uh, the circumstances in which there is an unconstitutional and undemocratic change of government uh, are defined actually in the African Charter on democracy and good governance. A expectation of African unity in the future, I hope, I am an optimist and uh, I hope that it will come about. Africans have been striving for unity for the past century and as sovereign states, they started that already in 1958 and I think that the African Union uh, is uh, the latest concretization of that African aspiration, of the aspiration of the African peoples to unity. And I hope that it will be realized through the sub-regional arrangements which have already been established in most African sub-regions. There is COMESA, of which Egypt now is a member, uh, there is ECOWAS in the west, there is SADC in the south, and there is the Maghreb Union in the north. Uh, East African Community. And there is the East African Community, and there is IGAD for the Horn of Africa States, etc. So all these are regional arrangements which were established to encourage and promote unity among African states and I think that is the manner in which African unity will gradually be realized in the future. Reform of the United Nations Security Council, well you all know it's blocked 
and we don't know when it will happen and I think it's not worthwhile for me as a judge to talk about it <laughs> so let's leave it at that it would be pure speculation and I don't like speculation what was the last question? Uh, I Were you able to decipher it? Dot. No, I couldn't. Can you? Why International Criminal Court bending the issues of the aggressive of their president long time to give them distance to do what they want? Where is the power? Where is the power of the International Criminal Court? Yes. Is that the question? Uh -huh. Well, the International Criminal Court, you know, does not have an er original jurisdiction. It has only complementary jurisdiction. So the, it can exercise its jurisdiction only when a country is unable or unwilling to prosecute persons or individuals who have committed certain crimes, crimes against humanity, war crimes, genocide, etc., and all this kind of thing. So uh, those conditions have to be realized for the court uh, uh, to indict such persons. And of course, the countries concerned also have to be party to the Rome Statute or their situation if there is a situation of conflict, crisis, or civil war, has to be referred to the court by the Security Council. So it is a complex, uh, or it is uh, actually a number, multiple factors that uh, bring about uh, uh, the consideration of a case uh, and uh, the indictment of individuals. Uh, by the International Criminal Court. So unless uh, one is uh, uh, more specific, it's difficult really to say where the power of the court lies. The power of the court lies, of course, in its jurisdiction, but as I say, it, it does not have an original jurisdiction. It has only a complementary jurisdiction. Thank you very much, Abdullah. I think we have... Uh we have uh, taken too, too much of your time. I think uh, this was an extremely, <coughs> extremely useful, uh, extremely useful uh, uh, dialogue, and it opened uh, uh, our eyes to to the contributions of the third world to the development of international law. We also uh, have reviewed what the situation is at present and how the uh, developing world uh, reacts to the changes in the international, um, international environment. Uh, thank you very much for your thoughts, for your ideas, and I would like to invite you to join me in thanking Judge Abdel Yusuf for having been so kind and for all the ideas and thoughts that you have uh, given us.